Ростов, всем привет. Uh, today we have uh, Erwin Weber, uh, founder of GDG uh, Cloud Tallinn and uh, infrastructure lead at uh, international technology company. And we'll have a discussion about Estonia, uh, success, успех Эстонии. Uh, will be really interesting to uh, listen. Uh, so please, Erwin, uh, I transfer mic to you. I... <laughs> Thank you. Well, the story of Estonia as becoming international technology leader is quite interesting one. And while preparing these slides, I realized that I actually was involved in it more than I thought. Uh, I think that good place to start story about how Estonia became uh, basically technology giant is to go through some history of how it happened. And basically the first uh, computer in Estonia was pretty long time ago. And it was in the biggest university because at the time the computers were huge and the only ones who could really afford them is basically universities in all the countries like America, Russia, or well, Soviet Union. And of course, Estonia was part of the Soviet Union at that time. So uh, we had what we had. The first computer was Sural 1, and it was basically the average computer of that time. You can fit it in one sport hall, but not much about it. And the next year after that, uh, the first Kubernetes uh, Institute of in Estonia appeared and they actually started building first locally built computer because the previous one was like imported from Moscow, I think. And the strange thing that only five years after that, the first school in uh, post-Soviet territory was in Estonia who got the computer from the Tartu University, the same rural one that arrived in Estonia. Mm. And I think it was like groundbreaking fact because actually the school not the university had the computer and they we had like first school kids who actually be was able to touch and interact with computer without going to computer science or going to university at oh, all wow. and basically uh, important steps after that is in 86 the soviet book of the informatics was translated from Russian to Estonian and was made more accessible to local people. And uh, two years after that, the first Estonian designed the computer was produced in Estonia and it was targeted at schools. It was something similar to, uh, let's say, Spectrum, for example. And it was basically the keyboard you attach it to some monitor and inside the keyboard you have the whole computer and one year after that the first fidonet note appeared in estonia well, what is fidonet it's like uh, tcp ip uh, network uh, basically yes it's like bulletin boards uh, where you connect via dial up to some other computer and mm. you can left message there or you can pull messages uh maybe oh, now nice where the governments are trying to crunch back on public internet access or do artificial borders among countries, maybe the dial up and Fido net like things will come back because if you use modem and dial up, you can basically just connect to some other computer directly without going needing the internet provider or anything like that. Who knows? Uh, okay, let's go to the more modern age. 1991, the Estonian gets uh, independence. We immediately get the first mobile phone networks. They are basically imported from Finland. And first actual TCP connection is uh, made from, again, from University of Tartu via satellite link. They connected to, I think, Swedish University of Technology. And at the same time, uh, .ee domain appeared and local internet started like growing uh, two years after that uh, we have uh, almost three and half hundred devices which are using like broadband or full-time internet connection with dedicated basically modem and it's the first time when country directs one percent of whole gross domestic product into the it sector 
and it was basically a deliberate decision. The country at the time, basically Estonia is a very small country and we have no national resources. We cannot sell gas or, for example, oil to like mass markets. And mm -hmm. the government at that time decided that maybe we can be the technology hub because, well, come on, our uh, school kids so many years have computers. Why not export the technology? And basically, it was a deliberate decision by the government. We are betting on IT. And I... <laughs> like Before today, IT was popular, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And basically, I can say that it was... Today I can say it was very right decision, at least for me. Okay, next thing. Two years after that, the Tigre Lab project started. Uh, it's called in Estonian Tigre Hüppe, and many people are translating into English directly as Tiger Jump, uh, but official name is Tiger Leap. The idea was that uh, you need computers and internet, you need to train the teachers to use computers and you need uh, to have some uh, national language school books and courses that you can provide to schools and universities on how to better use internet and computers. Uh, because of separation from Soviet Union, there was like rise of national self-awareness and national identity and the language became very important part of it. And so the project was started in year 97, 4,000 teachers got like 40 hour computer basic training. And that was actually a very significant percentage of all the teachers. It was like, I think, 80 or 90% of all the teachers. And the next year after that, the Tiger Tour was uh, first time like uh, happened. It's not the technology conference in a way that you think of it today. It was more like uh, it was roadshow. They had uh, like 50 or 100 computers uh, provided by local company Microlink. And uh, they used these computers to put the tents on the public spaces in different cities. And they visited like seven counties in seven days and that attracted 25,000 people. Wow. And people just were able to use the computers for free to visit some internet pages and just see what happens around them. Uh, if you can imagine, it was basically the end of the last century and uh, websites were not booming. <laughs> dot coms no, happened. <laughs> yeah, dot coms happened a bit later, and it was pretty quiet national internet. And under the same program, they continued with funding the schools because if you find uh, do proper funding, funding and allocate money to the schools, you will get school kids who get used to use technology like we currently do. It's very obvious for us that if you need something, you will go to the Wikipedia or Google, but at that time it was kind of out of box thinking and you had to invest money to teach people to do that. Uh, that's but, really long, long term, right? Investment because. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it paid off to... fully. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so basically, because of that program, we had all the schools in Estonia to get the computers, and in 2001, all the schools had also the internet connection, like all the schools in the whole country, not just capital cities or county mm -hmm. cities, like even small village schools, they all had internet. And I think it was very amazing. And the interesting thing was that in year 1999, I was already dealing with creating the web page for our school and that way I ended up being facilitator at Tiger Tour when they visited Tallinn. And that uh, is actually my first uh, involvement with growing IT in the country. You, are, you already was one of the first developer advocates probably in, <laughs> in Europe. <laughs> yes, you can say so, but I never thought about it that way before I started preparing this presentation. So yeah, that was interesting to discover. 
and basically uh, next big thing is in year 2000 the government said that internet access is a human right a uh, problem that we were trying to solve that was we have many many islands and on islands and more far away you get from capital city the more expensive internet was uh, we basically made a law that said that internet must cost uh, the same at all the places in Estonia. Yeah. And what? basically that led to the slight price, uh, internet prices growth in capital cities because it was cheaper before, but significantly lowered the cost of internet in the small villages and counties. And uh, because... Uh, are there people in islands? Sorry, I'm disrupting. Do you want me to ask questions in the end? Or is it okay if I just jump in? Yeah, and... go ahead. Uh, we have, I think... Uh, 1500 islands and many of them are populated oh it's a huge number it's so cold in baltics i don't know how to survive in island well, uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah. well it's pretty interesting and i actually have one story with islands it was from here i think around 2005 or something uh, basically we have one of islands which is closer to latvia than to estonia and it's basically the four hours boat trip from the coastline of Estonia. Mm. And uh, what amazed me that it was like four hours ship crew, basically it was like ferry. Mm. And all that time on the ferry, I had decent internet connection on my mobile phone. And for mm. me, it was incredible. You are like in the middle of the sea, you don't see any land to any side, but you have the broadband in your phone. And it was, wow. <laughs> because, well, a lot of people who, tra who are travelers, they visited the country and they were amazed that we have so much Wi-Fi points and internet coverage. And for me, it was quite normal. But when I was in the sea, it was quite strange for me also, because you don't even see the cell towers anywhere. Mm. Well, actually, even today, uh, I was uh, in Tallinn uh, a month ago, and I met a researcher from Taltech and Zamba. Hi, Zamba, if you watch this someday. Uh, and he actually came from France. He said, uh, internet uh, speed in Tallinn is better than in Par Paris and some French cities. And still, uh, it's the case that you have one of the highest quality internet, I think, in Europe. Oh, uh, yes, seems so. It's not the cheapest one, but it's good. <laughs> At least it's good enough for me. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, also important things that happened in the year 2000 that we founded the Electronic Tax Office and we introduced the ability of M parking, which stands for mobile parking. And before that, we had basically, when you park the car, you had to go out of the car, you had to find the parking automate, put some cash into it. When you get the ticket, you put the ticket into the car, and then you can go away from the car because you paid for parking. And the system was simplified that you use your mobile phone, you send the SMS with your car number, and you get back the knowledge that car is parked in the zone and the whole parking areas were divided into the zones with name so the, you can pay different like tiers of parking that's cool and it was in year 2000 just think about it for a while <laughs> oh, what was I? we were using cds we were yes, VHS. Yes, <laughs> yes. movies and you can already park your car via the phone in Estonia yeah. at the same time. Uh, electronic Task Office actually did not uh, yet accept the actual taxes, but it was doing a lot of support online. And it had help pages on how to fill the taxes, etc. But it was very important step towards what was happening next. In year 2001, the X-Road was introduced. Uh, it was basically it still is. It's one of the goods that is exported from Estonia globally. Uh, basically, it's something like breed of mesh network and peer-to-peer -peer network. It used centralized notification 
and it allows uh, many, many companies to have data published and consumed in a unified way. Uh, you can think about it as maybe some enterprise bus, like for message queue or connectivity inside your project that you're developing. But think of it on country scale. So eventual goal was to connect all the different governments, databases, I don't know, uh, reporting facilities into the same like unified data lake and use the data, I don't know how to say. Uh, probably today you can call it federated data access. Mm. And yes. we started that in year 2001, it was like live, but pilot project was actually in the end of the last century. Oh, wow. Uh, so it's today, a huge data warehouse. Uh, it, it is distributed. It's not like single point of failure. The mm. different databases are just plugged into the same. Uh, you can say it's a bit of like virtual network. Mm. And so it's today, proper like data lake. Yeah. yeah. And it. today we have two and six, uh, two thousand six hundred different services in Estonia in that service mesh basically today. It includes nowadays everything that you can think of. And it's standard interface, it's open source, it's consistent, and authorization is dealt like centrally. So if you're authorized in what service, you can later federate that access and use the other services without needing to log in again. Uh, next big thing, 2001, look at World Foundation. It was government funded foundation and uh, it uh, had three goals basically first time was to increase amount of the services estonian people are using and can use in internet secondly it was promoting people to get more internet in households and in third it was again uh, similar to tiger leap who was doing that in schools it was now targeting all the regular people as well to bring people attention to internet and training to use how to use computers. The idea was that now you have a lot of young kids who are okay with computers, but their moms, dads, or grandmothers, they still are not friendly with computers, but internet is for them also. And basically what they did in two years, they provided basic computer training for 10, percent of all the adult population of Estonia. And during that time, they also established a lot of public internet access points with free internet access. Basically, when you are visiting the bank or library, or maybe after movie, you can book the public computer and spend, I don't know, like hour inside the internet without need to pay a lot of money for that. And our e-school software as service was launched also in 2001. Uh, basically, it unified the, all the technology that you today maybe are using in the school. You can put marks to the kids. You can uh, ask parents to confirm absence of a kid, like sick leaves, I don't know, schedules, like everything inside a single app. And also what the Look at World Foundation did, it was providing the smart card readers, not only to the new internet access points that they established, but also for existing public internet access points that existed before the project. And maybe you are wondering why you need the smart card reader on public computers in 2001. It's because in the year 2002, the, now it's called the Estonian ID suit, but basically the ID card launched. It uh, was the, it became the only obligatory document that people in Estonia must have. And even before that card, all the citizens in Estonia, they're having unique ID code. It's like no pretty long number. It uh, has first digit as gender plus birth century combination. Then you have your date in ISO format, basically, 
when it's like three digit number, which key of the day you have been, and the last number is basically checksum. But having that unique ID number for all the citizens, it allowed uh, X road, for example, to have federated access, because once you authenticate it as owner of that ID code, you can get all the services that are targeting that ID code. But now with introduction of smart card, you have that ID code in the chip, you have a public certificate, basically open SSL certificate. And also the card allowed every person in Estonia to get an email in form first name, last name at ASTEE, which means that in 2002, because the document was obligatory, most of Estonian population got their first email address. That's awesome. Uh, there was some catches with it because it's basically only forwarder and you have to sign up another like uh, inbox to actually consume the messages. But you now had the unified format of how to email anybody in the country. They actually even had the LDAP server with public access. So if you don't know someone's ID code or email, you can basically look up that information. Uh, but now in GDPR times, that service still exists, but it's pretty limited. It's now, you have, yeah, now they removed personally identifiable information from it. And you can just look uh, for public certificate uh, of a person, for public key of a person, if you know the ID number. And uh, yes, the smart card has private key and public keys. Uh, it means also that every citizen of Estonia has electronic identity verified by Estonian government. How nice is that? And uh, you don't have to renew it every year, isn't it? It's not just electronic uh, signature, it's like a proper ID. It's proper ID, but you have to update it as often as passport, basically. Morning, Stepan. For you, morning for us, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And because that was not enough to become uh, the fully leader's country in technology, the law was passed that said that legally your electronic signature is actually exactly equal to the handwritten one. And that opened all the possibilities that, that came after that. Uh, in year 2004, the public uh, Wi-Fi access started booming. Uh, we have that uh, pretty nice orange mark, uh, which used to mark the parks and squares and like people attraction places like, I don't know, Shoreline, for example, that has public internet access and it's free access. And nowadays it's more like uh, quality sign like tested by Wi-Fi EE team that uh, says that this internet place is like good enough. And what they did it was again, they created the online map of public internet Wi-Fi areas. Uh, they showed tourists that, hey, Tallinn is almost like covered with internet, come visit us. Uh, it made actually Mm, Tallinn is an attractive place to visit because some of the tourists who are just curious in technology, they basically came to see, is it like true that you can just walk in Tallinn and have Wi-Fi almost everywhere? And in 2005, there was a pretty common article that said uh, Estonia is homeland of Kaza, Skype and Hotmail. Yes, Hotmail.com, which is currently used by Microsoft, it was also Estonian invention. I didn't know that. It was acquired by Microsoft, really? Yes, yes. Wow. And what is Kaza? Kaza. Aha. Uh -huh. Kaza is something that was staying uh, as like, basically it was grandfather of both Skype and BitTorrent. It was mm. fully distributed file sharing system and there is some legend that there was Oscar Award nomination winner who actually mentioned Estonia and its level of software piracy and movie piracy 
when he got their Oscar, basically. Mm. Oh, so, man. yeah. And if you would ask me what is Estonia famous for in technology, I would actually quote that article in years 2005 or 2006, because it was like, what everyone would say. Yeah, we're creators of Skype because everyone has Skype. Millions of computers worldwide have Skype. Everyone knows Skype. Now, yeah. 2005, next big thing for country. You can vote using your ID card from your home computer. How nice is that? It's transparent, isn't it? Actually, there are lots of discussions and white papers around it. I would say that it's quite uh, secure. And for transparency, they actually, well, they have the technology that allows them to publish all the digital signatures and envelopes so that the people who gave the vote and only that person using special key, he can see in the in the final blockchain if his vote was counted as he desired or not. But it was not there at launch, of course. The system was evolving over time. But the interesting is that uh, first you were able to vote only on your computer using your smart card. But later you can also vote on the phone because Actually, uh, the Estonian ID suit nowadays is on not only ID card, it also has mobile ID, which is basically a SIM card, special SIM card, which has ID card software embedded in it. So you can use mobile phone to mm -hmm. give digital signature that is verified and trusted by the government. So it's got uh, traceability uh, in place. Yeah. Yes. And the smart ID is even uh, next step from that. It's basically fully software implementation of smart card that you generate on your own device, be it tablet or mobile device. And you have to, after you generate the software implementation, you need to sign it with your real ID card and publish that you are the owner of that smart ID. The system does it automatically for you, but basically when you install smart ID on new device, you need to sign it with mobile ID or ID card once. And so, uh, so I can check, right? If I check whom did I vote, just in case if it's changed, I can uh, raise an alarm. Hello, Nurbek. Nurbek is a uh, DevOps uh, Kubernetes guru from our community. Uh, yeah, so sorry for interrupting on this. Uh, in theory, yes, you can check the vote, but I think they actually do not publish the whole blockchain to the blockchain to the whole population. Instead, there is like official, like on elections usually, are there are official election watchers who can get like access to the blockchain and verify it. Hmm. But they don't, uh, they cannot like trace back to the person who did vote unless the person provides them with like their part of key and asks what happened. So there are transparency safeguards in place in the system, but of course, like uh, any technology, it is not like 100% foolproof. For example, recently it was shown how simple it is to basically put malware on user's device, the device that is used for voting and steal the vote before it's like signaled by the by the user because mm. if you compromise the endpoint device you can do whatever you want on it including the stealing the vote mm. so the but, app vulnerability yeah but then again you can find the server site open sourced on github both the original version and the version that is used today you can basically fork pull request or whatever uh, the client side application is not open sourced because that would be quite harmful to the end users because there would be millions of malware applications that are exact lookalikes of the client software. But because the protocol of iVoting is basically public, 
you can, I don't know, use basic Linux tools and open SSL to cast your vote via curl, for example, mm. if you want to. And the interesting thing is that uh, electronic voting, well, it was designed to reduce amounts of uh, votes that are bought that election. For, ex for example, imagine a situation where the person who comes voting is basically bright by the party that says that if you vote for us, I don't know, you get one bottle of vodka for free. Uh, with electronic votes, that system became very, very irrelevant because with electronic votes, you can change your vote if you want to. Mm. So basically, you can go out, say, okay, I'm voting for you. Here is the screenshot. Give me my vodka. You come back home, you change your vote to whatever you want. <laughs> and even if you, for some reason, decide to not go to the... Uh, with the vote that you want, basically uh, electronic voting, it happens in early voting period. It's basically one week to official election day. And it's also used by the people with disabilities the, who, for example, are voting from home. It's common practice in different places to do so. And during that period, you can change your electronic vote as many times as you want to. And if you really, really want to change even the last vote, you can show up uh, with your passport or ID card and vote with your like paper ballot if you want to. And that will automatically render your electronic vote. Uh, uh, were there any uh, in like real life uh, cases when people tried to uh, hijack this whole voting mechanism and use it uh -oh. for bad uh, purposes? Uh, I assume it's used not only for president voting, but maybe for local authorities voting as well. Uh, local authorities voting and also the European Parliament voting. Mm. So that's pretty crucial stuff. Yes, but now they have bug bounty program there and it's open source, so there are a lot of security researchers voting on it. My personal stance on electronic voting is that if I trust my money to the electronic banking, why I shouldn't trust my vote to electronic voting? Yeah, it makes sense. It's actually they can, uh, if it's paper based voting, they can m more easily change it. <laughs> the authorities. Uh, yes, but uh, also no, <laughs> because it's a small country in people are talking to each other who they voted. And if there is a significant statistical deviation, it will come out basically on the next morning. Mm. And on this chart, you can see how many percentages of all the votes casted in one or another election was done online. So nowadays it's around the half of votes on paper and half of votes on electronic means. And I would say that for some people who are just lazy to go and pick the paper ballot, like electronic voting is just way to go. So more people are involved in voting. 2007, very interesting year. In that year, the government decided to move away one Soviet monument from the center of the city to the graveyard mm -hmm. where it should belong. And it launched uh, never seen before by any country, large DDoS attack and hacking attacks. Basically, it was non-declared Kuber war from Russia to Estonia, mostly from Russia. And uh, in Estonia, many of the technology services that we used to use every day, they were harmed by that attack. And it was really problematic. Of course, the government did react pretty quickly and basically they disabled international access to many of the services. So you can use, for example, internet banking only if you're inside the country. But this was shown that internet is fragile, info technology is fragile, and Estonia started pouring money and brains into how to defend itself on the Kuber war level. 
And today we have NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Estonia. And I would say that Estonia is pretty highly ranked on cyber security, like worldwide as nation. That's, uh, that's a shame, all this attack, I think. And I, in my country, we also experience some similar attacks, but yes. our cyber security is you know, on the race. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. we'll reach Estonian level someday. Yes, of course. But uh, again, we had early start because it happened, and we have by today governed a lot of like knowledge on the area. That, for example, allows us to help some other countries who are in need of cyber defense nowadays. Is it like in Finland? I, I guess also they are good, like crackers, uh, Estonia and Finland. Uh, yes, but because we got such an attack before the Finland, we again ha have a head start and they are mm. able to deal with threats better today just because the amount of knowledge that we covered is higher. Mm -hmm. Next, stop, 2008, electronic health. Uh, all the medical organizations, optics and uh, practitioners, they got connected to the same network dealing with health and dealing with patient data and all the medical records from that time, since that time became electronic. Firstly, it sped up a lot of processes, and secondly, the digital records are easier to maintain or look up, if you think about it that mm -hmm. way. Since year 2010, we also dropped prescriptions on the paper. They are now electronic, so you can call your family doctor, say your symptoms, doctor will validate them, for example, via Skype call, and you get electronic prescription to your ID card, which you can either go to Apteca and buy out, or you can get courier deliver them to you directly. It's cool. Uh, now I did a bit of longer jump from 2008 to 2014, because firstly, we are talking almost 40 minutes now, and secondly, mm -hmm. Uh, I think there are no big, like, groundbreaking moments in that time. The systems were just evolving. But in 2014, the e-residency was introduced. It was like world first approach. And the idea is simple. Estonia is a small country, no national resources. We have only one and a half million people in the country. But our country, like digitally, it has all the same needs as bigger country. For example, if you compare how much taxes are directed in the IT systems of UK, you will get a number with much more zeros than Estonia can afford to put into the Estonian IT systems just because the UK is so much bigger with more people and more money in their like tax system. And mm -hmm. Estonia decided, okay, we cannot like <laughs> hire more, uh, more parents to get more kids and increase population in Estonia in natural way, but we can maybe attract some people who want to do their things electronically and pay taxes to us. Because if you think about it, it's very easy to open company in Estonia, it's easy to do banking, etc. Maybe someone who is not citizen of Estonia and living I don't know, in America, and wants to found country, uh, found established company in the European Union, maybe that person can consider to do that in Estonia. And the e-residency program basically means that people of 160 countries, they can go to their local Estonian embassy, fill in some paperwork, verify their identity with their like national passport and get the smart card which is acting as Estonian smart card in a way that it is also trusted identity. It allows you to sign documents and uh, authenticate into the systems 
but without need to be actual citizen of Estonia. I actually have this card. This was really easy to uh, obtain. Yes, but that thing uh, to Estonia is very important because we got like 90,000 residents, 21,000 companies, and 31 million of extra tax income through that program. Nice, that's good for, for the country. Yes. And because that is not enough, in year 2020, we founded the new thing, the Digital Nomad Visa. Visa. Basically, if you are non-citizen of Estonia and you are working for some company, you can get, for company in Estonia, you can get working visa. If you are a tourist and want to visit country for some period, like three or, I don't know, six months maybe, you can get the tourist visa, but you are not allowed to work in the in that time. That digital nomad visa is something that is middle ground between two. If you are a remote worker from IT or any other like sector, but you can do your full time work remotely, you mm -hmm. can apply for digital nomad visa. The only criteria is that your income is like uh, around 3000 uh, euro per month. And that visa allows you to stay in Estonia for one year. You can legally continue working remotely for whatever place you are working for. And the Estonian benefit for, for that time is that you will spend your money that you earn remotely in our place in Estonia. So our local tourist business will grow, restaurants will grow, and rentals will grow. And if you ask uh, why you should come to Estonia as digital nomad, because it's a nice place to live here. Because all the technology things that I described earlier. Mm -hmm. In the year 2015, we became the world first country in the cloud. We have uh, encrypted and established the off-site backup of most critical services in X-Road and it stored in Luxembourg. So basically we, are, we became the first digital country with disaster recovery plan. Awesome. Year 2016, the country was introduced. Uh, that's very funny think because it looks exactly like your average software as a service page. It lists all the benefits, all the major benefits of Estonia, like a country. And on pricing page, you just uh, pick the country and you get a quota how much it would cost you to use a Estonia for your country. And uh, there is a purpose why I have put the date, not just year, but also month and day, because it was the April Fool's joke prank by our country to other countries to not only showcase Estonia as marketing material, but also to make people considering that they actually can have something like that for their own people. Because if you use more technology as a country, you will get time savings that lead to money savings that lead to increased revenue of the companies and you get more taxes. Exactly. And jokes aside, we actually have a dedicated building which called the A Estonia Briefing Center. It's located near airport. So basically if you're president of some country or prime minister, you can just take your private jet, come to Estonian airport and visit that center and consider what are the things that you can actually buy. Because Estonia has no natural resources, but we are doing a lot of digital exports. We sell software, we sell expertise, and you can modernize your country by learning from us. Uh, COVID started, but Estonia was well prepared. In year 2020, we introduced remote verification for notaries. So basically you can do all the things that previously required you to show up in the notary office and sign the papers on the papers. Now you can do it online. 
and since year 2021, there are two public processes that you need to show up with uh, marriage and divorce, because firstly, it's a tradition, and secondly, it's a place where you don't want to mess with people's consent without their knowing. So it's a kind of sensitive family area. Yeah. All the rest things can now be done completely online. As long as your smart ID, mobile ID or ID card are in working condition. And my claim of this presentation is that Estonia can be your nearby Silicon Valley, much closer, same continent and just three time zones away. In the intro to my speech, I promised to speak a bit why it's safe to work for Estonia and Mafia. This catchy phrase is actually a tagline that unites the small but tight Europe Estonian startup community. As Estonia is very small, all the startups here are actually interconnected. For example, people who worked in Skype, they got their shares and they had the money and expertise to start their own companies. They saw how the successful startup works. And basically, people who worked or tried one startup, they are highly likely to start another startup. People who yeah. had some free money from the shares that they had uh, participating in one of the startups, they can become the investors for the third startup. And all the startups here are pretty much interconnected, either directly through the founder, employee, investor roles, or just because they are used to drink beer together in the same club in the middle town, for example. Uh, most famous Estonian mafia representatives are on this slide. Probably you see one or two names that you are familiar it's with. Transfer Vice, it's a new one, isn't it? Uh, it's now called Vice. Mm -hmm. They are rebranded now. Transfer Vice is now just Vice, and they are but, second column of second. But by the way, this one's uh, Vice, they got HQ in London. I now, mean. yes. But they, but they are Estonians, right? Ah, yes, I see. yes, yes. The scaling. <laughs> uh, scaling out and basically you need to bring your headquarters closer to your customers because that's how the business works. Uh, next fact that is easy to check in the internet is that Estonia has most unicorns per capita in Europe. We have 7,7 .7 unicorns per million of people. That's unbelievable. Such a relatively not big country. Yeah. I think you guys are in some top league uh, uh, in terms of efficiency. So. And that's the very beautiful slide. It's a total funding of Estonian startups. Just look at the numbers and how they are growing. One billion. Or 100 billion. Uh -huh. I, it's, uh, for me, it's difficult to like, figure out what does it mean 100 billion. <laughs> it means that Estonian startups, even while funded in a very small country, they get international investments to grow. And second important thing that the COVID actually did not harm much. Hmm. And I would like to conclude my talk with call to action. Visit Estonia, work in Estonia, trade with Estonia, invest in Estonia, and of course, follow me on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, guys, uh, questions, please, you can just type in the chat. Пожалуйста, вопросы можете писать. При необходимости будем переводить на английский, потому что вопросов, в принципе, у меня пару вопросов есть. Потом, если не будет вопросов, мы как бы закончим. Можно будет Эрвину писать в LinkedIn. Эрвин понимает на нескольких языках. Вот. By the way, uh, uh, there is a startup wise guys, right? Uh, quite famous uh, in uh, are they somehow related to Skype? Because I, I have a couple of friends from startup wise guys. Uh... Basically, as I said, all the startups in Estonia are very interconnected. We actually have 
nowadays the pedigree of the startups, which uh, is a picture that has outlined the investor, employee, and founder roles of the startups. But I think it's currently copyrighted image, so I did not include it in the slides. Yeah. You can find it. And yes, the Skype is tightly connected uh, to other startups because it was the first huge startup, famous startup. And it did inspire a lot of people. A lot of people who did quit St Skype for one or another reason, they took the knowledge and founded their own startups. It's massive. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, question. There's some guy, Rain Akobi. I don't understand. It's probably German. Looks like a spam message. I don't know. <laughs> I know, Erwin, if you can understand this language. Uh, it's, it's, yes, it's uh, definitely spam message. I'll just delete it. Uh, but I actually okay. don't see other questions in this chat. Any oh, okay. Now I see. Yeah, but. Yeah, this one's old, Kuanish, he's just saying, basically saying hi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nice guy. Uh, I think there are no questions. Uh, we, we, since there are your con contacts, people will uh, be asking you directly if there will be any. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I know you uh, have a uh, busy uh, time period. I wish you energetic week and uh, welcome uh, to Almaty uh, anytime uh, we have compared to Estonia we have much warmer weather and it's really nice in summer uh, and uh, I think your uh, uh, slides your today's speech will be uh, serving people many startups from Central Asia for maybe forthcoming years uh, Estonia especially you mentioned your, your residence it's a good opportunity for people to create legal entities in Estonia or operate globally and uh, kind of uh, they can live in two countries. There is a good local joke about the fact that if you are having computer and internet, when founding the new company with its bank accounts, website, etc., it takes three hours and two mm. hours of which you will spend uh, finding the unused names. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I heard that you have the number one uh, air quality, the f most clean air in the mm. world. I'm not sure, but uh, I can say that because of half of population is living in capital, if you move away from capital and you can do it because you're a digital nomad, for example, you will really enjoy beautiful nature and cleaner air. Mm. But uh, have you been to Tartu? Actually, you mentioned several times the uh, uh, role of Tartu University in uh, creating oh, this uh, yes. digital infrastructure. Yes. I, I thought actually that uh, Tal Tal Tallinn Technology University is kind of top, but it seems that Tartu is the same level or even... Uh, uh, basically, Tartu is general university and Taltech is technology university. So it's like mm. comparing apples and pears. Mm, For example, you. if you want to be a doctor, the Tartu is way to go. If mm. you want to be an IT specialist, then probably Taltec will be a better place because it actually inherited and joined with Kubernetes Institute from the first of my slides. And they are mm. basically one entity now. Mm. This, yeah, the Soviet uh, Kubernetes Institute. Nice. Друзья, если есть вопросы, пожалуйста, есть последнюю минуту написать, либо мы будем спикера отпускать, потому что еще рабочий день. Uh, I think the no questions for uh, okay. exactly now. Uh, thank you very much, Erwin. We will uh, say bye to our friends and uh, we could just do a short talk. Uh, after. We, probably, <laughs> we probably can meet each other at the Google I.O. virtual experience next week because a lot of people will be just walking there in the development relations booth, for example. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, we'll, it's really interesting how they will do it this year with this maybe special chats, some virtual experience. Uh, I'm actually planning to run the special chat next week to have joint keynote watching. Oh, cool. 
Uh, you are very welcome to join. I'll I'll definitely join, uh, and hopefully we'll meet in person in uh, some Google I/O next year if they will do offline. I heard some rumors they are re reviving offline. Well, let's hope. Thank you very much, and uh, let's keep all the best to you. Peace. Всем пока. Пока.